Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today I've got a massive head-to-head -head benchmark comparison between the AMD Ryzen 5 7600X and Intel Core i5-13600K. And for this one, I will be covering 54 games in total across three resolutions using the RTX 4090. So yeah, we have a lot of data to go over. Recently, I compared these two processors in a dozen games using various memory and motherboard configurations to work out which offered the most value. In the end, they were much the same, and in short, the 3600K enjoyed the advantage of generally much stronger productivity performance, while the 7600X was a more efficient processor supported by a superior platform that should offer a significantly better upgrade path. And that being the case, you could really make solid arguments for going either way, and at least at this point in time, there's no wrong option. Still, many of you have been hounding me for a big benchmark comparison, I guess in the hope that it'll make the choice easier, or perhaps you're just genuinely curious to see how they stack up across a massive range of games. And either way, I've spent a little over a week to make it happen. So without further ado, let's quickly go over the test system specifications and then jump into the benchmarks. The Ryzen 5 7600X was tested on the MSI Meg X670 E Ace motherboard with 32GB of DDR5 6000 CL30 single rank memory, while the Core i5 3600K was tested on the MSI Z790 Tomahawk using 32GB of DDR5 6400 CL32 single rank memory. Now, please note the DDR5 6400 memory used for the Intel platform doesn't work on AM5 as it doesn't offer Expo support. So the memory has to be manually configured and that's not something most users will be willing to do. Also, probably more importantly, to run at 6400 speeds, a fabric frequency of 2133 MHz is required and only the best silicon will achieve that frequency while maintaining stability. So realistically, DDR5-6000 is the limit for Ryzen 7000 series processors while 13th gen Intel CPUs can go beyond DDR5-6400 with ease. So it is not unfair to test Intel CPUs with higher clocked memory, as they do support such memory, whereas Zen 4 CPUs typically won't. Then finally, the graphics card of choice is the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 4090. Also, please note we are using Windows 11 and resizable bar was enabled for both test configurations, as that is now the default for these motherboards. Now, as I've mentioned, 54 games were tested, though I've also had to drop a few popular titles as they're no longer useful or practical for testing high-end hardware, mostly due to in-game frame caps. Such games include God of War, Control, and Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, all of which were maxed out even at 1440p at the game's frame limit. I've also had to ditch Microsoft's Flight Simulator as I've been unable to log into my copy of the game for the past few weeks, due to a server detection error which I've posted on Twitter. Basically, the Microsoft Store is utter trash and it makes testing games there very difficult, if not impossible. So please don't complain to me about the absence of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Complain to Microsoft because it's 100% their fault. Okay, let's get into the results. Starting with Fortnite, we find very similar performance between these two CPUs and interestingly, the 3600K offered slightly higher 1% lows, around 5% higher here, while the 7600X pushed the average frame rate higher, up to 5% higher. And the most significant margin here was seen at 4K, where the 3600K produced 8% greater 1% lows. Overall though, not a big difference here, and both managed to push high frame rates in our Team Rumble late game match. Okay, so let's jump into what is probably the most confusing benchmark of this series, Battlefield 5. Oddly, with the 200 FPS frame cap removed for both configurations, the 1% lows were fairly similar, but the average wasn't, as the 7600X was 36% faster at 1080p, 56% faster at 1440p, and even more shocking was the fact that we still saw a 50% margin at 4K. It looks as though we're testing two different games here, but after multiple retests, I did end up with the exact same results. I'm not really sure what's going on here. I don't know what is holding back the 3600K. In both instances, I did set the frame limit to 900 FPS and I triple checked the quality settings. Needless to say, everything was correct. It's possible this is an E-Core bug. I'll have to spend a bit more time looking into that one. Suggesting that what we saw in Battlefield 5 was some kind of bug is the much newer Battlefield 2042 where the 3600K performed really well outpacing the 7600X at both 1080p and 1440p. 
Here we see that the 1% lows are up to 16% greater with the Intel processor, and we also see a 7% boost to the average frame rate. By the time we reach the 4K resolution, the game is now GPU limited, so given we're only using the medium quality settings here for that competitive advantage, it's fair to say both processors are more than fast enough and will almost always result in GPU limited performance in this title. Horizon Zero Dawn really seems to prefer the Ryzen processors, but unlike Battlefield 5, I don't believe this is a bug, as we've seen this behavior with AMD and Intel CPUs for quite some time. In this example, the 7600X delivered up to 21% greater 1% lows and 29% higher average frame rates, both seen at 1440p. Despite that, the 13600K did deliver stronger 1% lows at 4K, though the average frame rate was slightly lower, so overall, performance was much the same due to a GPU bottleneck. Rainbow Six Siege also liked the 7600X for driving big frame rates, hitting 722 FPS at 1080p, opposed to 626 FPS for the 3600K. I'm not sure that margin really matters, but 1% lows were almost 20% higher with the AMD processor, and similar performance trends were seen at 1440p, and then at 4K the game does become heavily GPU bound, so frame rates here are basically equalized. Moving on to Halo Infinite, and here the 13600K did nudge ahead at 1080p by a 16% margin, hitting 213 FPS, though 1% lows were only improved by 6%. Then at 1440p, the Intel processor's lead is reduced to 7%, and then at 4K, the 7600X was repeatedly a few frames faster, which is a little bit odd, but this behavior was witnessed in a number of games. Doom Eternal performance was much the same using either CPU, and this was particularly true when focusing on 1% lows. Average frame rate performance was up to 5% stronger with the Intel processor, but I doubt many of you will notice the difference between 564 frames per second and 595 frames per second. Now, I know a lot of you have complained about the frame rate performance in Gotham Knights, but damn, I didn't think it would be this bad. Armed with an RTX 4090, we couldn't even hit 120 FPS at 1080p. In fact, we saw the same performance limitation at all three tester resolutions. In short, performance sucks in this title, but the 13600K was up to 8% faster, though typically we saw margins more like 5 to 6%. Forza Horizon 5 isn't exactly a CPU demanding game, but this is a 54 game benchmark, so I've included it and thought we might as well take a look at the data, as these results, or rather these margins, are fairly typical of what you'll see in most games. So that is to say, basically identical performance between these two CPUs, at most the 7600X was a mere 3% faster. Using the Call of Duty Modern Warfare multiplayer benchmark, we find that the 3600K is up to 12% faster, seen when comparing 1% lows at 1080p, though we saw just a 6% margin when comparing the average frame rate. Those margins are significantly reduced at 1440p and then completely eliminated at 4K, so while the Core i5 was technically the superior performer here, for the most part the margins were rather insignificant. Then for the single player campaign using the ultra quality settings, we see that CPU performance is virtually identical as the game is now primarily GPU limited. So similar results to what we saw in Forza Horizon 5 for example. Next we have Red Dead Redemption 2, another visually impressive single player game, though this one can be quite CPU demanding. The 7600X did come out on top here, delivering 6% stronger performance, but again, those are hardly margins to write home about, especially given we often declare margins of 5% or less to be a draw. The last game I'm going to look at the data for is PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, and I was surprised to find that the 7600X delivered stronger performance here, though the 1% lows were virtually identical. Still, when looking at the average frame rate, we see that the 7600X wins by up to a 13% margin, so not a massive win here, but it's at least noteworthy. Well, as expected based on previous testing, the 7600X and 3600K do appear to be very similar in terms of gaming performance. That said, previous tests have only featured a dozen games, and we've only looked at data for 13 of the 54 games tested here, so let's jump into the comparison graphs for the full breakdown. Okay, so our day one review data, which is based on a 12 game sample, had the 7600X leading the 13600K by a mere 3% margin. Now, with that testing expanded to 54 games in total, the 7600X is 5% faster, so basically the same margin, at least in terms of how relevant it is. Also, if we remove the Battlefield 5 data, which is potentially bugged due to an issue with maybe the E-cores, the 7600X was just 4% faster. 
Either way, as I noted earlier, we always deem margins of 5% or less to be insignificant, in other words, a tie. Basically, despite using the world's fastest gaming GPU at a low resolution, performance overall is much the same as both the 7600X and 3600K are very fast gaming CPUs. We're talking about single digit margins in over 70% of the games tested. Then as you'd expect, the margins do come down a little at 1440p, and again, Battlefield 5 is really the only outlier here. On average, the 7600X was just 4% faster, or 3%, seen in our day one review if we remove the Battlefield 5 result. Then finally, at the 4K resolution, the 7600X was a mere 2% faster on average, or again, 1% if we remove the Battlefield 5 result. We also see that in a little over half of the games tested, the margin was 1% or less. And this data is going to be fairly representative for those of you running an RTX 3080 or slower at 1440p, though that may not necessarily apply to esports titles using low quality settings. Now before wrapping up the testing, here's an interesting look at total system power consumption when gaming, of course with the RTX 4090. On average across these six games looked at here, the 13600K consumed 14% more power than the 7600X, and that is total system power, so the actual power consumed by each CPU, the margin will be greater there, but still in the grand scheme of things, a 14% margin doesn't sound like a lot and realistically it's probably not going to be for most of you. But in many instances we were talking about 60 watts or more with the bigger margins of almost 120 watts, which frankly is an absurd difference. Based on this, the Ryzen 5 processor will be easier to cool, though I'm not entirely sure how relevant that information is as most of you will strap a decent cooler on either one of these processors. Still, even if you plan on undervolting or tuning the power usage of these processors, the 7600X is starting from a far better position. So there you have it, a detailed look at the gaming performance of the AMD Ryzen 5 7600X and Intel Core i5 13600K. Both are exceptionally capable gaming CPUs, both deliver a top tier experience, and both are worth purchasing. The advantage of the Core i5-13600K is its superior productivity performance, as it can often put those e-cores to good use, offering substantial gains over the 7600X. Also, for those of you who like to tinker with their hardware, so dabble in overclocking and memory tuning, expert overclocker Buildzoid claims that the 13600K is a better choice, offering more headroom and a greater degree of memory tuning. There's also a wider range of sub $200 motherboards on offer, thanks to support for 600 series boards. And of course, there's also backwards compatibility with DDR4, meaning it can carry over older memory or purchase from the vast pool of already available DDR4 memory. That said, when CPU bound, DDR4 performance will generally be slower than that of DDR5. So if you're building an entirely new PC or executing an entire platform upgrade, I recommend jumping on DDR5 now. The advantage of the Ryzen 5 7600X is that it's a more efficient processor, consuming less power, which in theory should make it easier to cool, though I don't believe cooling to be a major consideration here. The real advantage for the Ryzen 5 part is the superior AM5 platform, which will support at least two more generations of processors, offering a broad upgrade path for those investing now. As I've said, there's really no right or wrong option here, by default, they're both excellent products, and ultimately I think you do need to toss up between stronger productivity performance and platform longevity. My only real advice here would be if you can wait, do so, at least until early next year. Normally, we see some interesting announcements come out of the CES trade show, and I'm expecting that AMD will want to breathe some life into AM5 sales, which could mean 3D vCache models or more affordable non-X versions. Not only that, but I expect AM5 board prices to have dropped a little bit by then, and likely DDR5 pricing as well. It's also possible that pricing on Intel's side will become a bit more competitive, and of course DDR5 pricing will also be relevant there. So sitting on the sidelines to watch how this all plays out might be the best strategy for now, and of course we'll have many more benchmarks for you over the coming weeks and months, so make sure you are subscribed for that. Also, if you'd like to become a Harbour Unbox community member, we have Floatplane or Patreon. Both will give you access, or either will give you access, to our exclusive Discord server. Monthly live streams until myself. We get together and answer your questions live. Uh, behind the scenes content, Q&A. There's a lot of cool stuff there, so if you're interested, check it out. But if not, that is perfectly fine. Oh, and remember, all of the graphs available, all 54 graphs are available to Patreon and Floatplane members. So if you want to go and check out individual games, that's another cool thing you get there. But otherwise, yeah, we're done for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve. I'll see you again next time.